right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. 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 This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Amen. Amen. Well, it's always a, a joyous time in the life of our church when we can start the service off with a baptism. And I think baptism is a great way to start off an Easter service because of what baptism symbolizes. Because what it symbolizes is our what happens when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. This water here is symbolic of a watery grave. And we're put into the grave with Jesus. Our sin, our shame, the old sinful self were put into the grave with Jesus. And just as Jesus rose from the grave on the third day, that's why we're here today. We're celebrating the fact that he rose again. So just as Jesus rose from the grave on the third day, that we too rise again to a new life in Christ. And that's what baptism is symbolic here today. So I, I present to you this morning Kai Spencer for, for baptism. I had to talk with him this past week and Grandma, Granddad brought him to my, my office. We had a good talk, didn't we? Yeah. He, okay. Okay. Ty, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Then upon your profession of faith and obedience to our Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You'll sinful self put to death. You raised a new creation in Christ. Amen. We're going to pose for pictures here. Right, that'll be a good picture. All right. That'll be good. Got it? Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, amen. Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you for Kai, his commitment to you. Father, I pray that his faith and his love for you will continue to, to grow and take deep root, Father, Lord. I pray for his parents. I thank you for their parents who brought them here, Father, Lord. And I pray that their parents will continue to raise their children in a way that they should go so that when they're older, they would not depart from it. So, Father, into your hands, I commit Kai and his faith and this service and all that we do here today. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Then I looked and I heard the voice of multitudes of angels. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise.
Uh, right after the baby dedication, we do have uh, uh, two babies to, to be dedicated this morning. Uh, right afterwards, we'll have a time of prayer. And you see that good looking man right over there by the door? We're going to have a time of prayer. And then all the children can be dismissed to Greg. And Greg's going to take them upstairs where they're going to learn about the resurrection using uh, uh, Easter eggs. And then they'll probably have a little Easter egg hunt out here in, in the playground. So that's for all the, the, the children. So if you want your children to go with Greg afterwards, uh, he'll be standing up there. But it's always a great joy in the life of our church. What a great day. We're celebrating the resurrection. We're celebrating baptism. And now we're celebrating a baby dedication. Okay. So if I could have uh, Maggie. Maggie Brooks, she's uh, dedicating Aiden Michael Brooks and Daniel Scott Brooks this morning. Which one are you? Huh? <laughs> Are you Daniel? And this is Aiden Brooks. Now, this is your, your dad? This is my dad. My yeah. Okay, and the father-in-law is coming. Now, her husband is in the Army, huh? All right. And he's stationed in North Carolina, so he's not able to, to, to be here at this time. So the, the, the father-in-law and the dad are, are stepping in for him uh, as the role of the, the father, raising the children in a way that they should go. Now, as Baptists, we don't believe in, in christening uh, or infant baptism because you can't find that in the Bible. It's not scriptural. We believe that baptism is for believers only. So what we have in, in church in place of baptism, in, infant baptism is uh, children's dedication or baby dedication. And I think rightly called, it, it should be called parental dedication. Because what we're doing here this morning is these parents are coming here forward this morning and they're presenting their child or their children to the Lord. They're dedicating them to the Lord, to raise them in the ways of the Lord. And this could be something they do at home. In fact, it's something they, they, they should do at home. But it's also something that we're doing publicly before the body of Christ. Because as the body of Christ, you're going to vow to, to pray for these children and to help nurture these children in the ways of the Lord. What a cutie. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And, and the precedence before this could be found in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, 27 through 28, where Hannah presented Samuel to the Lord. And Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 9, says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk with them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. So when should we be talking to our children about the Lord? All the time, right? Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And then Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And also Jesus said in Mark 10, 14, let these little children come to me. Do not hinder them. Do not hinder their faith. So, uh, mom and vicarious dads, I commend you for, for being here today and committing these children to the Lord, to raise them in the ways of the Lord. It's been said children are our gift to us, and how we raise them is our gift back to God. Amen. It's God's desire that we raise godly children. But that doesn't happen. We have to set an example at home. We have to train the children in a way that they should go. So understand something. This, this ceremony is meaningless if the parents themselves are not dedicated to following the ways of the Lord. So dads, let nothing enter the home that will injure the souls of these children. Let nothing destroy the, these, the faith of these beautiful souls and serve as a good example in the home. And mom, if, if a child is going to grow up to know of God's love, he's going to know it through you first, through the mother's love and, and love and purity and, and, and kindness. Now, if it is your intention to present your children to the Lord and pledge to raise them in the ways of the Lord, then please answer, we do, okay, to the following promises. Do you here this day recognize these children as the gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessings? Do you here this day dedicate these children to the Lord who gave them to you? 
Do you here this day pledge yourselves to bring up these children in the ways of the Lord? Do you here this day promise to set a godly example at home, at church, for these children? Do you here this day commit to pray daily for these children? And do you here this day ask God's blessing upon these children's lives and commit them to the Lord? Church, do you here this day share in the responsibility of raising these children in the ways of the Lord? Do you... Promise to pray for these children. Then get out this handout. Because this is the prayer of dedication. You should have this in the bulletin. you're, You're doing great. You're doing great, buddy. You too. All right. I'm going to read the fine print, and you all read the bold print. Lord... These tiny hands are so trusting. They are so innocent, and yet they will grow in a world that has been tainted by hatred, greed, sin, and darkness. Lord, protect these children. We give them to you. Lord, the future seems so uncertain, and yet we look at these children, and mysteriously we have hope. Wait, Lord. As parents, spiritual leaders, teachers, mentors, and friends, Lord, anoint us to give them an overwhelming sense of security that can only come from you. When they are hurting, when they may fail, when they are lonely, reach out to them and commune with them and remind them that you will never leave us, nor we. You are Jehovah Shema, the God who is present. You are Jehovah Rophi, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Nisi, you are our victory. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. You are Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, our shepherd. This is our prayer for them. We pray that you will be their shepherd, that they will be left in need. Lord, make them lie down in green pastures. May you lead them beside still waters. Restore their soul. May you lead them into paths of righteousness for your namesake. Yes, even though they will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may they fear no evil, for you are with them. May your rod and your staff comfort them. May you prepare a table before them in the presence of their enemies. May you anoint their head with oil. May their cup run over. May goodness and mercy follow them all the days of their life, and we pray that they will come to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Now we have two baby dedication certificates. This is to certify that Aidan Michael Brooks was publicly dedicated to the Lord on the 27th day of March in the year of our Lord, 2016, at Cibolo Valley Baptist Church. And You all are going to have to sign that line there, okay? And this is to certify that Daniel Scott Brooks Jr. was publicly dedicated to the Lord on the 27th day of March in the year of the Lord, 2016, at Cibolo Valley Baptist Church. Can I pray with you all? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you on behalf of these parents and these children. Father, as they seek to raise godly children in this ungodly world, give them wisdom. Give them strength. Give them discernment, Father Lord. Give them patience. And Father, right now, at an early age, grab hold of these children's hearts, Lord. Father, may they never depart from you, your ways, your will for their lives, Father Lord. Be with the parents, Father. Strengthen them and just bless their walk, Father. We love you and we thank you for these children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Right. Good job. Good job. All right. High five. All right.
Remember I said we're going to have children's church? Well, this is your time to go. Children, if you want to go to children's church and learn about the resurrection, use an Easter egg and not an Easter egg hunt, go ahead and follow Greg over there. I'll tell you what, to make it easier for the kiddos to get out, how about if we all stand up before we sing our next song, He Lives. We'll sing the first and last verses of this song. Boys and girls, make your way over there to Mr. Greg. today we would really like to show a video regarding an offering you can give so let's have a seat please this offering is for our Annie Armstrong missions offering and uh, it our goal is at 1035 1600 and we have reached 1035 so watch this video to see how God may use your offering She was Megan, the perfect picture of the troubled teen. Anorexic and alcoholic, raised right, but sinking fast. One day, I went into uh, an alcoholic coma um, because I hadn't eaten for four days, and I woke up that morning in the hospital with like things hooked up to me, and I was like, what has happened to my life? In a city full of religious symbols, people in Montreal sometimes have to look hard to find Jesus. Being a, a Christian uh, in Montreal, it's like being a dinosaur. Like today, we've been doing a car wash and people keep asking, why are you doing this for free? And we tell them to love the community. To them, it's kind of odd. Two years ago, Tony Silvera, web developer slash church planter, started Passion Center in Montreal. And one year ago, his daughter started bringing her friend Megan to their new church. I never met such a, like, a close-knit community. It's so powerful. Like, everyone's just always there to help each other. God cares about who you are. Megan started to come, and little by little, uh, we saw a huge change and that's the result of your, uh, your prayers and also of your financial offering. Because let me tell you, without the Annie Armstrong uh, offering, we will not be able to be here. 
This is what God did with your gifts. Now Megan is studying fashion design in college. Now she's sober and clean. And now she's part of a new church where the love of Jesus has changed her from what she was. It's been like a complete 180. It's pretty crazy. And I mean, it was the encounter that I had with God through the Passion Center. And uh, I am so incredibly thankful. Like, incredibly thankful. Like, can't even wrap my mind around it. Amen. How can God use you and how he's blessed you to reach a life? Amen. Before our prayer, we ought to mention Sunday school teachers. We're probably going to be a little late on this service today, but that's okay. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, ushers, if you'll come on down and uh, do our offertory prayer, and then the choir will present the offertory music this morning. Holy Father, as we think about the resurrection and think about the agony that you went through in order that we may have salvation. Lord, we had to just say, who, who, who are we that we have the love of God to overshadow us? And Lord, it's not who are we, but who are you? And Father, we just ask you now to, as we remember the great gift that you have given us, that you'll take back just a small part of our thankfulness in our offering and ask that you take the offering and bless it and, and Lord just use it to your honor and glory in Christ's name I pray amen now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. They found the eleven and those assembled with them and said, it is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. I was taking a trip on the plane the other day, just wishing that I could get out. When the man next to me saw the book in my hand and asked me what it was about. So I settled back in my seat, a bestseller, I said, a history, a mystery, in one. And then I opened up the book and began to read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was born of a virgin one holy night in the little town of Bethlehem. Angels gathered round him underneath the stars singing praises to the great I Am. He walked on the water, healed the lame, and laid the blind to see again. And for the first time here on earth, we learned that God could be a friend. No, he never ever did a single thing wrong. The angry crowd chose him. Then he walked down the road and died on the cross. And that was the end of the beginning. That's not a new book, that's a Bible, he said, and I've heard it all before. I've tried religion, it's shame and guilt, and I don't need it anymore. It's superstition made of tales, just to help the weak survive. I said, listen to me, read it again. It's going to change your life. He was born of a virgin one holy night in a little town of Bethlehem. Angels gathered round him underneath the stars, singing praises to the great I Am. He walked on the water, healed the lame, and made the blind to see again. And for the first time here on earth, 
We learned that God can be a friend. No, he never ever did a single thing wrong. The angry crowd chose him. Then he walked down the road and died on the cross. And that was the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning, he said with a smile. What more could there be? He's dead. You said they hung him, put nails in his hands, and a crown of thorns on his head. I said, I'll read it again, but this time there's more, and I believe this is true. His death wasn't the end of the beginning of life that's completed in you. Don't you know he did all this for you? He was born of a virgin one holy night in the little town of Bethlehem. Angels gathered round him underneath the stars singing praises to the great I Am. He walked on the water, healed the lame, and made the blind to see again. And for the first time here on earth, we learned that God could be a friend. Though he never ever did a single thing wrong, the angry crowd chose him. And then he walked and he died. Three days later, three days later, three days later. Sing your praises to the great I am. He walked on the water, healed the lamb, and made the blood to see again. And for the first time here on earth, we learned that God could be a friend. Three days later, three days later, three days later. Hallelujah. Wow. How do you follow that? All right. Good morning, everyone. If you need a bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand. We will get you a bulletin. You may want to follow along today's sermon. There's an outline of uh, the sermon in your bulletin. And also there's uh, uh, page numbers on the back of the outline, and they correspond to the Pew Bible under your seat in, in front of you. Now, this is a joyous time in the life of the church as we gather to celebrate the greatest thing that has happened in the world, in history. That Jesus overcame the grave, overcame death. I remember I was trying to talk to my brother, uh, who, who is an atheist. Uh, and I, I tried explaining to him how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And how he rose again on the third day. And I'll never forget his response to me. So what? What do you want from me now? So I want to ask you this morning. Has the resurrection in your life made any difference? Or is it just, so what? What, what do you want from me now? What difference does it make that Jesus rose from the grave 2,000 years ago? Does it make any difference in your life whatsoever? Well, Jesus tells us in John chapter 11 the difference that it should make. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to John 11.25, page 16.35 in your pew Bible. Are you there? 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Father, Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. Illumine us, Father, Lord. Teach us. Tell us, Father, today what you would have us to hear. And Father, may, may we not just listen to your word, but may, may we capture your word and put it in our hearts so that we would not sin against you. Father, uh, into your hands I commit this service, Father. Bless each and every person here today. May we catch a glimpse of, of who you are and your glory. And Father, speak through me this morning. Give me your words to proclaim. Father, I know apart from you I can do absolutely nothing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number one, if you have your hand out, three truths about the difference the resurrection should make in your life. Number one, the first truth is you have victory over death. How would you like to have victory over death? Would you like to have victory over death? Everyone wants to delay or beat out death, don't we? I mean, that's the reason we, we, we exercise. You know, I'm, when I drive to church sometimes Sunday morning, I see people out running on the road, exercising. And I, in a way, I'm thinking to myself, you know, exercise is good, but you're not going to cheat death. There's only one way to cheat death, and that's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But, but we want to eat right, we want to exercise, we, we want to delay death as long as we can, but the fact is, death is inevitable. There's still a ratio of one death per person, right? But, but why is that? Why, why does anything or everything have to, have to die? There's not one thing on our planet that lives eternally. Couldn't God have created us that we would live eternally? And you know what? He did. If you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, when God got done creating everything, he looked back and said, it is very good, very good. But then something happened. Sin entered into the world. If you would, keep your place where you're at. We're not done there. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, page 1714 in your pew Bible. Are you there? And it explains to us what happened. It says, sin entered the world through one man. Who is that? Adam. And death through sin. You see, God didn't create us to die. In fact, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says God had put eternity in our hearts. He never created us to die, but sin entered into the world through one man, Adam, and through that, death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So you see, death was not part of God's original plan. Genesis chapter 2, I'm not going to read to you the story for the sake of time, but God put one tree off limit in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve just had to eat from it, didn't they? Right? They were tempted by the devil to, to disobey God and ate from the tree. And through their disobedience, sin and death has entered into this world. Boy, what if we stop there? Be awful dismal. But you know, we celebrate a risen Savior. We celebrate a risen Savior who, who rose from the grave. In other words, he overcame death. You see, the devil's only weapon against us is death. But we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the grave couldn't hold him, and he overcame death. Now Jesus, go back to John eleven twenty five. 25. Now Jesus tells Martha, in John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. So Jesus is basically telling her, whoever believes in him will live. They will live eternally, they will live spiritually, even though they die physically. Now Jesus was talking about victory beyond the grave, eternal life, living spiritually. Then in verse 26, Jesus says, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Does this mean we will never die? No, because that would contradict Jesus' first statement, wouldn't it? What Jesus is basically saying is, whoever lives physically and believes in me will never die spiritually or eternally. You see, there are two different deaths. There's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. 
And there was a death that happened in the Garden of Eden. And it was a spiritual death. And it took a while for their physical death to catch up to their spiritual death. And you know what? As we're alive physically, that's the only time we have an opportunity to be born again. To be dead spiritually and to be separated from the Lord is, well, that, that's our eternal condition. John 4, 24, if you would, turn to page 16, 19 in your pew Bible. John 4, 24. It says, God is spirit, and worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is spirit, how must we worship him? Spiritually. But if you're dead spiritually, how can you worship a God who is spirit? It's like trying to pick up uh, uh, FM stations with only an AM radio. You, you can't do it. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, turn back a little bit more to page 16, 17. Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again, what? With the Spirit of God. Why? Because we're dead spiritually. And we must be born again spiritually because God is spirit. And to have a relationship with God, we have to be born again spiritually. So how important it is, us, is it for us to be born again spiritually? Very important. Jesus said no one will enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again of the spirit. Amen. Jesus said to Martha, if you believe in me, you will never, never die. You will, you will gain a life where death has no power over you. Romans 8, verse 9 and 11, says that when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we receive his Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the grave is now living within us. And if you would, turn back just a little bit more to John 5, 24, page 1622. John 5, 24. And Jesus says that when we believe in him, what happens? What's it say in John 5, 24? You cross over from what? From death to life. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you, you, you ever hear someone say, well, why don't you get a life? Right? Why don't you get a life? And you know what? I, I want to say that to you this morning. Why don't you get a life? Get a new life in Christ. Because we're dead spiritually. And in order to get a life, you have to have Jesus to be born again. And then you will cross over from death to to life. You know, trying to extend your life with uh, uh, vitamins and oils and lotions and exercising and eating right, all that is good because we are the temple of God and we should take care of the temple of God. But trying to extend your life by doing these things, uh, it's, it's not bad in and of itself, but I compare it to painting the Titanic in hopes that it won't sink. It may look good going down, but it's going down, right? You see, our, our answer is not in diet and exercise and all that good stuff. It, it's good for you, but our answer is in Jesus Christ. Number two, the second truth. The only way to the resurrection life is in Jesus Christ. The resurrection life is in Jesus Christ. The first truth is we have victory over death, and then the resurrection life is in Jesus Christ. Look at John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this was in response to, to what Martha said in 1121. Jesus, uh, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, Martha knew that Jesus uh, had great power. He was the Messiah. However, her hope was in a far off, distant future. Verse 24, she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So her, her future wasn't right then and there. Her, her future, her hope, was something that was going to happen far off in the future. But, but Jesus stops her and said, no, no, Martha, you don't get it. I'm the resurrection and the life. In other words, the resurrection and the life is not something that's going to happen in a far off distant future. The resurrection and the life is happening now in me. It's standing before you, Martha. I'm the resurrection. I am the life. 
Understand something. When you have Jesus, you immediately have eternal life. Do you understand that? Eternal life is not something that happens when you die. You're already plugged into eternal life. And if that's the case, your worship of God, your eternal worship of God has already begun. Amen. So Jesus is not just something nice to have. Jesus is not just a a crutch for weak people. Jesus is life. And some of us need to get a life. Our hope is not somewhere off in a distant future. Our hope is uh, right now. In Jesus Christ. Now, how could Jesus make that claim? What would you say to me if I said, Church, I am the resurrection and the life? Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, right? So, how, how could Jesus say that? What gives Jesus the, the right to say that? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word was Jesus. God became flesh. Also, Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy by dying on the cross. Did you know that? Look at John chapter 20. Stay in Luke because we're not done there. But look at John 20, verse 1 through 9, page 1651 in your pew Bible. I want to point something out to you. You know, you, you hear stories where, you know, the, the Bible is just a bunch of made-up stories uh, that, that Jesus' body was stolen because they wanted to uh, 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 prove the resurrection. Uh, you know, that, that line of thought is thinking that the disciples knew Jesus was going to rise from the grave. That they knew that. But you know what? They were clueless about it. They had no preconceived ideas about Jesus, even though Jesus tried to explain to them. They had no preconceived ideas about Jesus rising from the grave. They they, they only determined it later through Scripture. So understand that. When this was written, uh, the disciples weren't even expecting the the resurrection. So look at John chapter 20, verse 1 through 9. Are you with me? Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. And verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So look at Luke 24, 26, page 1611 in your pew Bible. This is after the resurrection. And there's two disciples walking along the road, uh, dismayed after the resurrection. And Jesus tells them, Luke 24, in fact we'll start in verse 25, Page 1611, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? Jesus is trying to explain to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, this had to happen. All the scripture that was written about was written about me, and this had to happen. In other words, if you knew your scripture, you'd know this would happen. But they went to the tomb not knowing it was going to happen. They were looking for the body. So I want to just look at one passage in the Old Testament that prophesies about Jesus Christ coming. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, page 110 in the Pew Bible. In fact, if you get a chance, sit down and read all of Isaiah chapter 53. I think that's one of the greatest prophecies about Jesus dying on the cross. And coming back to life again. Isaiah 
Well, in fact, look at verse 9, 53, 9. We'll start there. Are you there? Page 1110 in your pew Bible. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, as though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. Well, that sounds to me like Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross, doesn't it? He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the, Lord, uh, and the will of the Lord will prosper his hand. Verse 11, after he has suffered, in other words, after he has been crucified on the cross, he has put into the tomb, after he has suffered and died, what will happen? He will see the light of life and be satisfied. So here we have a prophecy of, of the future Messiah being crucified on the cross, suffering, dying, and coming to life after his death. So what gives Jesus the right to say, I am the resurrection and the life? Because Jesus knew who he was. He knew what he was about. And he knew that the death that he would die for our sins could not hold him. He was always about the Father's business, right? He stepped out of glory in heaven to die on the cross for our sins. You know, Jesus, in the beginning, it says he created all things. All things were created through him. There's nothing living or that has lived that was not created by God. Everyone, do me a favor. Go like this. You feel it? Boom, boom. You know you owe your next heartbeat to God? You, you can't control your heartbeat. You don't know how many times it's going to... But when it stops beating its last beat, it's over. Or is it? Because if you want to get a life, you need Jesus. Because Jesus said, even though you die, you're going to live forever. Because I have overcome the grave. I have overcome death. Amen? Amen. You know, scientists can make clones by transferring DNA, uh, you know, but they can't give the spark of life. You know, we cannot, with all our technology, you know, we cannot even give the spark of life to a blade of grass. Do you know that? Only God can give the spark of life. Only God can, can give life. But who gave God life? Nobody. Nobody. If you would, look at, uh, um, I think it is John 5, 24. No, John 5, 26, page 1622 in your pew Bible. And somebody read that when you get there. John 5, 26. Did you guys hear her back there? Can you stand up and read that? The Father has life in himself, and he has given life to the Son. So the Son would have life in himself. So who gave God life? Nobody. God has life in himself. What in our universe can exist without something else? Nothing. Everything in our universe is contingent upon or, or, or uh, uh, needs something else to, to exist or survive. Everything. Everything. We can't survive by ourselves. We need food. We need water. Our planet can't survive without the, 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 the sun. Our universe can't survive. So somewhere, there has to be the beginning of life. Somewhere, it's like who pushed the first domino over? Right? Who is the giver of all life? Who, where does all life emanate from? And it emanates from God. He has life in himself. You know, what's, what's interesting, uh, I'm going to really dazzle you with my brilliance now. <laughs> Nuclear science tells us that all substance in the universe is constructed of three little particles. And it's the neuron, the proton, and the electron. Now, in the nucleus of the atom... There are neurons and protons, and the electrons are out there. But the neurons have a negative charge, and the protons have a positive charge. 
And within uh, uh, the nucleus, you have six protons and six neurons. Pastor, what are you getting at? <laughs> have you ever grown up and played with magnets? Right? Uh, like like uh, uh, charges, what, repel each other. Right? You can't put the magnets together because like, like charges repel each other. And that's called Coulomb's Law. And it says... Protons should not be able to live side by side in the nucleus of atom because light charges repel each other. That's, that's Coulomb's law. So you have six protons inside. Yeah, there should be a, a, a nuclear explosion going on. How can these protons be existing side by side when light charges re- repel each other? Carl Darrow, a nuclear physicist, said, The nuclei have no right to be alive and should never have come into existence should never exist. And mind you, this is what everything in the world is, is, is made of, protons, electrons, and neutrons. But in the nucleus, it says it should never have come into being because there's no reason these protons should be staying together inside that, that nucleus. So what holds the nucleus to, together? Why is it not a potential nuclear explosion? Scientists just don't know. They don't know. In fact, they call it nuclear glue. In fact, they came up with a name for this nuclear glue. And get this, it's called Colossus. Colossus. But I'm here to tell you, it's not Colossus. You know what it is? It's, it's Colossians. Colossians. Look at Colossians 1.17. Look at Colossians 1.17. <laughs> Are you with me? Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is Colossus, right? He is the resurrection and the life. He has life in himself, and he is the giver of life. And the Bible tells us that we must be born again. you got to get a life. Why? Because the Bible says we're dead spiritually. And the only time we get a chance to be born again spiritually is while you're in this body. That's it. Some of us may need to get a life. The life from above. The life that only He can give. You must be born again. Amen? So what what difference does the resurrection make in your life? Has it made any difference at all? You know, you know, it should. The ancient Egyptians believed in eternal life. In fact, they spent their whole lives preparing for the, the, the uh, afterworld, uh, the, the underworld. Uh, that's why we have these great tombs and great pyramids, because they spent their whole lives. They believed that when you die, you would go to this, this underworld. So they spent their whole life preparing for this. In 1922, in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Howard Carter dis- discovered King Tut's tomb. The good news, it was full of riches, gold and uh, everywhere and jewels. It was the most incredible treasure ever found. The bad news, King, King Tut was still there. It was still there. He was still there. Why? Because, you know what? Only the, the spirit lives forever. But the body dies. And in order to enter heaven, this body, we get a new body. We must be born again. You see, they had, a, they had the right idea in preparing for the afterlife. But it just goes to show you popular opinion is not always right, is it? You know, we need to prepare for eternity. And we need to prepare for eternity the right way. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. 1861 in the Pew Bible. And I'm, I'm closing up here real soon. First John chapter 5, verse 11. Y'all doing all right? All right. Turn to your neighbor, ask them if they're doing all right. Doing all right? All right. <laughs> okay. First John 5, 11 and 12 says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. He's given us life. And how do we find this life? How many of us want to live forever? I know I do. Not in this world, not in this fallen world. 
but I want to live forever in eternity in heaven with God. So how do we get this life? It says, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Can it get any clearer than that? I mean, that's black and white. If you have the son, you have life. Life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. And then he goes on to write, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know without a doubt that when his heart quits beating, that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Do you need to get a life this morning? We're going to have an invitation at the time, at the end of this service. And that's your opportunity to respond. You know, uh, Jeff Foxworthy and uh, uh, Larry the Cable Guy, they're coming to town. And my wife and I, we're going to go see them. We're going to get her done. (laughs) But I'm, I'm just going to show up. I'm not going to get a ticket. Yeah. I'm just going to show up. You know, what do you think the usher's going to say to me? Uh Uh-uh. I say, wait a minute. I dressed for this. Look at me. I'm all dressed up. I want you to know driving here, I obeyed every traffic law getting here. What do you think he's going to say? You know, some of you think you're going to get into heaven without Jesus Christ, without the ticket of Jesus Christ, because you look good. And maybe you act good. But you know what? You must be born again. If you do not have the ticket of Jesus Christ, you're not getting into heaven. Do you understand that? Let's look at the third truth, and then we're going to close up. So how do, you, how do you get that ticket? How do you get it? You get it by believing in Jesus Christ. By believing in Jesus Christ. Look back at John 11, verse 25. Jesus said, he who believes in me will live. Verse 26, whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Three other times in this passage, for a total of six times, Jesus talks about believing in him. In 1115, 1140, and 1142. So what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? It it means much more than just agreeing to the facts. It means much more than just agreeing to the fact. In other words, I, we can all agree. I agree that 2 plus 2 is 4. We can agree to that, right? Uh, we believe that the world is round. I believe that. I, I agree to that. I believe that a man landed on the moon. I believe that. I believe you're listening to me. But listening, uh, believing has to do more than with just agreeing to the facts. Because when we agree with the fact, it takes no response, does it? It takes no action. It takes no commitment. You see, I believe water can satisfy my thirst. But what must I do? I have to drink it, a response, an action. See, that's the type of belief that Jesus is talking about. He doesn't want us just to agree with the facts. Oh, yeah, I agree. You know, the Bible says that even the devil believes. Do you know know that? So it takes more, you know, in a survey done, 80% of Americans surveyed said they believe in God. They believe in God. You would think with such a godly nation, why is there so much ungodliness in our world? If 80% of our nation believes in God, do you know why? Because it's a head knowledge. They just agree with the facts. Oh, I believe Jesus is not asking us to believe that way. He wants a response, a commitment, an action on on our behalf. You see, I can believe that 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 airplane, inside that airplane, is peace, joy, happiness, and salvation. And I could stand outside that airplane all day and admire the door, admire the wings. I could even believe in the inspiration of the flight schedule. But you know what I have to do? I got to get on the plane. I got to get on. And some of you believe, but you haven't got on. There's been no response. There's been no action. There's been no commitment. 
And that's the type of belief Jesus is talking about. He's not just asking you to believe in the facts. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sin? Uh Uh-huh. Do you believe that he rose again on the third day? Uh, yep. Much more than that, isn't it? Because when you truly believe, you start living your life for Christ. There's a response. There's an action. There's a commitment. And if you've never made that type of response, that type of action or commitment, that's what the Lord is calling you to do today. Not just a head knowledge belief, but a response. So what is your response to the Lord today? He's asking you all to believe in him, to believe what he has done on the cross for your sins. He's asking you to believe that he is the resurrection and the life. He's asking you to believe that, not just agreeing with the facts, So what type of response will that take from you? It will take a response from you saying, yes, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. And you have to get off the throne of your life and let him sit in his rightful place. And no longer is your life dictated by you. Your life is now dictated by him. All of the affairs of your life are dictated by him. And oh, what peace that brings, though. You know, because a slave doesn't have to worry about where he gets his next meal. And we serve an awesome master. Bill Bright called himself a slave for Christ. I I love that term. We're a slave for Christ. But we don't have a cruel master. We have a master who tells us over and over again, do not worry, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to take care of you. But we get in trouble when we want to handle things. So we're going to have a time of invitation. How are you going to respond to this message? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the empty tomb. And, Lord, you're you're asking each and every one of us today if we believe in you. You're not asking us if we just agree with the facts. But you want us to believe in you in such a way that it transforms our lives, that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for you. And your type of belief requires a response, an action, or, or a commitment. So, Father, I pray that there will not be a person here today who leaves without getting a life. If they have not answered the the, the question, if they're going to heaven with peace and joy, then may they answer it. May they settle it today. May they believe in you. So, Father, we have an opportunity right now, Father Lord. Draw us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.